Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the meeting of the Joint Archives Board. Um, my name is Councillor Laura Beddo, and I am the Cabinet Member at Dorset Council for Culture, Communities and Customer Services. Um, and we are joined by various members of the board, various supporting officers and guests today, who will introduce themselves as we go along, I think. Um, George, Democratic Services Officer, do we have any apologies for this meeting? Uh, there are no apologies, but we have councillors Dunlop and Lepedavan attending virtually. Okay, fantastic. Many thanks and welcome to our online colleagues as well. Um, so item two is the appointment of chairman um, for the today's board and I understand that due to um, the joint agreement, this is an appointment that will go through to 2024. Um, do I have nominations, please? I'm trying hard to raise my hand here. I'm sorry. Given that um, you and I have to share the uh, chair and the vice chair, I would uh, like to nominate new Councillor Beddo for chair. Thank you. Um, do I need a second? Thank you, Councillor Biggs. Uh, welcome, Councillor Christopher. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, appointment of Vice Chairman. I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Beverly Dunlop. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded, Chairman. Brilliant. Many thanks, Councillor Deadman. Um, so, uh, Councillor Dunlop, if you're content uh, to Vice Chair, that would be fantastic. Um, yes. Thanks, Brilliant. and thanks to uh, Councillor Deadman. Fantastic, thank you. Um, moving on to declarations of interest. Um, does any member have any declarations of interest that they need to make for this meeting? No? Nope. Many thanks. So, moving on, we have public participation. I can't see any public. So, no, no indication. Uh, questions from members. Uh, we have no questions provided to us from members. Um, urgent items, there are none. So without further ado, uh, we will welcome the star of the show, uh, Sam Johnston, Service Manager for Archives and Records, to take us through the Joint Archives Service Plan uh, 21 to 26 and the monitoring report. Um, so Sam, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, obviously, you've, you've had the report in advance. I'd, I'd just like to sort of run over a few um, highlights, if I may. Just to say, it's been a very busy um, seven months since the last meeting. Um, and just, just to pick up on a few things, um, particularly perhaps draw your attention to section four around the public service activity. There's a lot of, appreciate there's an awful lot of detail in there and, and numbers and statistics, but really I think the sort of drawing out the, um, the messages for me at least, it's very much a, a mixed economy still. We still have um, significant numbers of people wanting to come into the history center to, to do their research. Um, but equally, there's, this, there's, a, there's a very strong um, growth in remote inquiries, as you'd probably expect, with digital access um, and, and people requiring um, copies of material that we hold. So um, the staff are being, being sort of drawn in both directions, if you like, and we're trying to balance the two, the two requirements out. But so far, so good. It's working, it's working well. And I think, you know, there's, there's no spare capacities, really, I suppose, one of the messages. It's, it's, they're very busy, even, even when there aren't people immediately in front of them. Um, moving on a little, um, and just to say, I suppose just finally on that point, 4.8, just, just how good it is, that just how much information we're able to get out there, the, the, the tweets, the blogs, and the, the newsletter that goes out to 10,500 subscribers, which will be very um, helpful to us because we're just about to launch our, our public consultation around the History Centre's um, capital project, which I'll come on to later. So um, we're hoping that a good number of those people will, will respond. Um, on community engagement, section six, just briefly to say we're very pleased about the work that was done. Um, it's now largely complete with the Kushti Bok organization, the Gypsy Romani Traveller community, a cultural body. Um, it's been very successful in the lottery. We're particularly happy with our um, support for that project, which was, I think, for the officer involved, quite onerous at times, but it's, it's ended successfully, very successfully, and good relationship formed. 
um, a range of other things there that we we have been uh, doing. I think we've, uh, you know, we're pleased that you know, despite the relatively um, low or small small capacity we have, we've we've sort of reached quite a lot of areas that we um, around the whole county, well, in, you know, into BCP uh, as well as as well as Dorset. Um, mentioning there at the end that we're working with the lighthouse in pool on their on their, on their archive and their future aspirations for that for that collection um moving on to section seven and the records of, of the two councils um very pleased i think the highlight for me is that the, the um, progress we've made around the use of um, digital preservation and with bcp's records the adoption um services there with children children's services and aspire we've had several very successful meetings with them and we have actually now transferred the digital digitized um, adoption records for, for part of the BCP's um, adoption holdings into Preservica where it's being um, safely managed alongside Dorset's adoption records. Um, and just this morning actually I was really pleased to hear that um, my colleagues had a, a, a very sort of useful conversation with the communications and um, tourism folk and they'll be transferring a very large volume of their um, film and photographic content into Preservica in the future as well. So it's, it's growing slowly. I think the, the, the message the sort of, the, the, um, that I, I would like to sort of um, share as well is that working with departments is quite, can be quite time consuming because each, each department needs to be talked to individually. There's no, there's no single point of contact, if you like. Um, and that, that it, it, you know, so it takes a long time to achieve, but when we get there, the results are very positive. Um, and I would encourage, uh, certainly encourage where I can, the BCP departments that we have worked with to, um, you know, to, to keep at it. We're very keen to make um, progress with, with democratic services in BCP as we have here in Dorset, um, particularly the ModGov system, because the, the transfer of that material in is, is a, it's a, it's an absolutely, um, you know, obvious way of, of, of saving on that paper record um, and, and doing things more efficiently. Um, Section eight on digital preservation, which I've touched on with, with regard to the um, digital records of the councils, but just to say, I'm really pleased to highlight the fact that we're now Dorset History Centre Joint Archive Service is leading on an 18 member consortium, which we've signed off through with our legal colleagues and procurement colleagues support, um, which is excellent for all the members concerned because the, the, the half price, roughly 50% saving on the, on the system, but also the fact that we have this collaborative model across authorities up and down the country. I think, I think um, you know, places as far afield as sort of Birmingham, Staffordshire and Kent uh, have signed up to this. Also opens up doorways for, for funding that we can apply for as a, as a group to, to take things further. And we've got a bid in at the moment uh, for some government money, um, which we, of course, we may or may not get. Um, on the collections management side, just to say, paper records are very much still with us. Um, there's still an awful lot of material coming in. Um, list there of some of the material that's come in recently. The most recent of all um, is the archive of Bournemouth Transport Limited, the yellow buses, which we collected at the back end of last week. Um, a half a van load of records and some brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, you know, photographs of the of the tram drivers of yore, um, which we intend to share. And I, I, I hope to talk talk to with uh, Councillor Dunlop about doing some publicity around that. So very pleased to, um, it kind of underlines the need for business archives and the importance of them uh, because so many people are associated with that. Um, and also the eyes and ears that um, councillors and um, officers provide for us because we don't always hear about these things. And just to underline that is, um, that's a really important function that um, they, they can perform for us. Um, also to say that thanks to our Dorset Archives Trust um, supporters, we've been able to purchase various, a number of really interesting um, documents from recent times at auction. Um, again, that, that work goes on. Small, quite often smaller sums of money, but things we simply couldn't afford to do um, ourselves. The, the kind of outstanding um, challenge that we have at the moment is Thomas Hardy, not, 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 not him personally, but his archives. Um, we, we still need £60,000 to catalogue the collection. We have, a, we have a crowdfunder out there, which is growing ever so slowly, um, but, but obviously there's, a, there's an awfully long way to go. And... Um, I think it perhaps reflects on the, you know, the public appetite at this current time for, for non-essential spend. Maybe um, we aren't giving up. We, we we have our we have our sort of feelers out in all sorts of places, but it is a it's a big ask, and I you know fully fully conversant with why people have possibly other things on their minds right now. Um, that that was my kind of brief overview of the of the um, paper. If anyone's got any questions, obviously.
Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. And, um, and actually, um, I always enjoy reading these um, reports because they do cover such diversity. And I think um, the point that you made just now about um, members and that sort of ground level intel about bringing things forward. You know, we've had an example of that just recently, haven't we? Um, I think with weather reports, something like that. Yeah. So, so really just a kind of uh, timely reminder that archives is sort of everywhere and it's really really an important thing that we, we need to be aware of. Um, open the report up for comments. Um, I've got Richard, and then I've got Marion online. Richard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, uh, it's very interesting about the, uh, well, all the activities, but particularly I was uh, interested about the um, digital records and the, the corporate memory, which is a major part of the um, consultants' report. So I mean, clearly that all the work is underway to, to, to get those in and that's been a, been a challenge. I suppose what I would look for ultimately is to see the benefit. How can we measure that they're actually using it? Because there's no point just, well, obviously there's a report because it's kept for those, those critical sort of legal issues years down the line. But the councils could save money by accessing them and and not making the same mistakes perhaps and reading through that and, and that sort of changing culture and that may be something that perhaps it's not your job to do but I, I wonder how we nudge people to use them efficiently because if we just store them for future records that's great for a history point of view but I think the consultancy thing was actually this can save councils money and then you can if you can demonstrate that you, you're going to help unlock funding for when you want to do expansions and things like that, really. So your thoughts on that would be useful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, th I think there's a number of um, things in there. I think the, very, the, the most basic, obvious thing, I suppose, is, is the fact that we're not, we're not using paper anymore. We're using digital uh, transfer of digital content, um, which, which is, uh, does provide a, a small manner, manner of saving. But I think the more important um, thing about it is, is, the, is the sort of changing culture away from... The, the expectation that paper records will be available. I think some of the benefits will be hard to measure until until for several years to come because uh, accessing that material is only going to be as good as the finding aids or the catalogues that we can provide to 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 do that. Um, a lot of it's about work with records management around the metadata standards that we employ when you create the records because if when they're ingested, the ultimate ambition with this is to automate so that you won't be you won't rely on you will rely on humans as little as possible because it will all be done for us um, so that material will, will move seamlessly. And I I'm, I'm say this advisedly because we're, we're a long way off that, um, into the digital preservation platform where it will be stored in the cheapest manner possible um, in, in, in um, Amazon Glacier, which is a cheaper form of storage than your standard immediate um, instant access. Um, and it will be accessed as, um, as required as, as paper records, I suppose. A lot of what it provides as well is mis risk mitigation, which again is a hard thing to measure until until you're face to face with the situation where you can't find things. So things like adoption records, we we know that the the media in which those were stored was degrading. Um, it was microfiche, which was about was in the process of, of rotting um, through uh, chemical process, and they had to be got off there because there was no other for there was no other copy of those records available. So those are some of the most highly confidential sensitive records we hold um, open open to individuals and officers only of course but and, and the right people at the right time so there's a number of different factors in there I think um, culturally as I say we want to we want to work with as many council departments to ensure that they the creation the, the procurement of the systems that they they acquire which is a, we're a long way off doing yet but the, when they procure <coughs> a system they they do it in such a way that the the ultimate um, transfer of records is taken into, into consideration. Um, it's not at the moment. We have, for example, with children's services, we have two legacy systems which hold uh, adoption records, which they have, to, they have to maintain these systems, even though they're no longer used, because there's no other way of, of, of accessing that information. So we want, in our, in our small way, to play our part in ensuring that there's efficiencies in other parts of the council, that, that their thinking is linked to what the, the, uh, the ultimate... Um, access to those records, whether they be confidential or publicly accessible. 
um, so that when they enter our system, th there's metadata applied, the public can see what there is, um, and if they're el eligible to access it, then they can do that online. But it is quite a hard thing to, to, to provide a, a sort of um, uh, business intelligence sort of um, view on it at, at this stage, because it's relatively early days. But I'm pleased to say that here at least we are, you know, we're relatively, um, you know, in terms of what local government's doing with digital preservation, we're quite well advanced. Um, but there's a lot more to do. Sorry, it's very windy. Uh. No, that's brilliant. Thank you, Sam. And I, I would expect nothing less than us to be very well advanced. Um, I've got Marion online. Marion, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm very impressed with the report. I mean, it, it's uh, clearly there's a lot of good work being done, particularly on the digital preservation. Um, but there are also the the physical um, items. And actually, the report answered a question that's been uh, niggling me for years. And that's what happens to books of condolences. Once they've been completed and the event has passed, I got a partial answer when we visited Althorpe a few years ago. And there's shelves and shelves of uh, books of condolences for Princess Diana. Um, so my question actually is, in addition to the ones for um, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, are there many other sets of books of condolences in the archive and the history centre? I'm afraid my honest answer is I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to go and, I'd have to go and check. I, um, I, we did look to see if there were um, books of condolence for um, uh, Princess Diana when she she died. Um, we don't appear to have any, so I, 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 um, I could do the um, get out of jail card, which is I wasn't here when that happened. But however, um, I'm not I'm not clear on why we'd have we have don't appear to have any for that particular event, and we do. Um, or... can, can I can I say I, I mean having seen them in a rows of books in also, but possibly across the nation they were all put there. I don't know, but um, it seemed likely. It's possible they were sent, sent to a central location. Um, I, I think times have changed and now they're expected to be collected locally, but there has been a much more of a, um, a move in, in recent years towards um, collecting um, the records of a public, um, uh, it was a pu public memorial. Um, and I think, you know, with things like the, um, the, the uh, air crash in Sussex, the Manchester Arena bombing and so on, it's become much more of a... Um, a cultural thing now to collect those things and I think that that's possibly something that didn't quite happen so much in the past um, but I, I for previous sort of deaths of monarchs and so on I'm, I'm not sure what we what we may have I'd have to check excellent thank you can, can, can I come back I mean it, it was really a, a curiosity whether this is the first and only or whether there is a significant number i don't need to know the detail of how many or which ones but uh, you know more the uh, but the background uh, uh, that's a really interesting question and i think you know sam we can take that away um and maybe just do a little bit of digging um and and, and come back to you if that's okay um beverly did you want to come in Beverly, you're muted. You, you're still muted. Yeah, the uh, mute button on my headphone set doesn't appear to be working. So, okay. Um, I think the, uh, the microfiche comment was quite interesting um i'm old enough to remember when it was uh, the latest thing and popping things old record paper records onto microfiche and now it's sort of obsolete and uh, wasting away i just got a, a couple of um things i wanted to uh, say first of all congratulations on the bournemouth transport archives i know that the yellow buses are uh, people in bournemouth feel very passionate about the yellow buses so really well done on that and yeah i think some uh, good publicity is needed on that um on the i was just around the comment in seven two i think it is that um BCP has these gaps and um, my interpretation of that is we're um, not so great when it comes to our records and it was really about what 
uh, those of us from from BCP need to take away with us from that on um, is there something we need to be doing is there you know people we need to be speaking to about that I know is is Matty there as well yeah yeah just really what we need to take away from from that thank you um I've, I've harassed Matty on, on a few occasions uh, um, about, about the records situation. Um, it, it's not for me to criticise, and I wouldn't wish to at all. Um, Dorset Council and BCP Council do things very differently. Um, Dorset has a records management service, which, which is responsible for working across the authority to gather those records and help to organise them. Um, my impression, my understanding within BCP is that it's down to a service, each, each service to manage its own material to organize its to, to work to its own retention schedule um, and there is no kind of coordinating entity within the council which um, in my experience is, is, would be a very it would be selfishly it'd be a very good thing if there were one because then I'd have a single point of contact for records the identification of those key record sets that need to transfer to the archives um, and as I say at the moment it's a little bit of a moving target because each service does does manage its, manages its own uh, records um, they're stored in, in a number of different locations, um, which is why it's so pleasing when we have it, in, you know, it sort of individual, build good relations with individual services like, like the um, children's services team. Um, and they, they clearly understand the benefits of what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, so it's, it's about trying to, a little bit, co if I had to say one thing, it's about more, a little bit more coordination. Um, and for me, at least, um, you know, fewer people to talk to about a, com a common need, which is that... Uh, transfer of, of essential material to the History Centre. Well, okay, thanks for that. And uh, perhaps um, if there's anything that um, that you, uh, in a particular set of records that is really quite critical that we need to pull together, perhaps you can let us, let us have some information on that, what we might need to do in those. But yes, I hear what you're saying about coordination. Thanks. Thanks, Beverly. Um, Matty, you wanted to come in. Matty writes up, and you are Lisa's opposite number. Um, just to support what um, uh, Sam said, I think there is a, a kind of lack of coordination in BCP, partly because of the legacy arrangements that existed before, so there isn't necessarily a, uh, an entirely common approach to what ends up in the, in, in the archive. But on a positive point, there are some signs that, that uh, we're moving some of these things forward. And Sam talked about the adoption records, for example. So I think there's starting to, starting to be some, uh, some progress in that respect. And also, uh, we are in the process of consolidating our office accommodation. Uh, and I think it kind of links to that a little bit in, in that many services are quite um, uh, organized around the buildings that they operate from. And that's often where their, uh, where their records are, are retained. So as we go through that process and we consolidate the number of buildings that we're using uh, one of the one of the items of work we're doing is is archive what what archive requirements are required when we move people away from those buildings so I'm hoping that will improve the flow um, obviously there's a danger that, that some ends up with so much coming forward that you know, we, we, we then that leads us onto the conversation of, of the project and the extension and all that goes with that but certainly that's a useful prompt for us to think about what it what we need to keep and where we need to keep it and, and the, the role the archive plays in that. Thank you. Thanks, Matty. That's really helpful. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else. There we go. Simon, do you want to come in? I had the pleasure this weekend of talking to some local Marshwood Vale residents and they mentioned their daughter had gone to the Midlands and I didn't ask where whether it was going to be Leamington Spa, Buxton, or wherever. But their daughter uh, had, had made clothing in the manner of Jane Austen because she was a, a great fan of Jane Austen and was a member of the Jane Austen Society. And clearly, other towns in other parts of the uh, country are clearly uh, benefiting from their heritage i.e. we speak very much of Thomas Hardy, but we don't necessarily consider all the literary talent that has actually uh, been developed within the county of Dorset. And by way of better example, 
Devon, for instance, has recently unveiled a statue of Samuel Taylor Coleridge at Ottery St. Mary. And I just wonder if we could do more to actually benefit from out-of-season tourism due to all the historic links we actually have with great literary talent. Now, if we come back to uh, Jane Austen, well, clearly there is the link with Lion Regis and Persuasion, and that makes me think of John Fowles as well. But I don't just think of John Fowles, I also think of Wordsworth, William Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy, no less. At Raystown, on the edge of the marsh with Vale Ward, who met with Coleridge on many occasions. And what records do we have? How can we capitalise on out-of-season tourism? Because clearly, Dorchester is doing well uh, in as much as it has Shire Hall, and the County Museum is absolutely brilliant, etc. But I just feel that Dorchester and other parts of Dorset could well do with, with, a, uh, with a lift. And I have to say that your, your comments are remarkably good, and I, I would be delighted if you could actually come round to the parish councils in the Marshwood Vale Ward and talk of the work that you're doing. But I just think that we need to capitalise more uh, on our literary links. And my final point, and as a cabinet miller, I'm sure Councillor Beddoe will take this on board, but when a tourist drives towards Dorchester and sees a sign saying historic market town, well, it may say historic market town, but it's a very drab sign. And I think locally we need to up our game. Our game. And uh, I'll be interested in the comments both of the portfolio holder and also of officers. Thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, really good point. And I know that we had um, Dan Snow down didn't, doing some filming recently, didn't we, in the, um, in the museum around uh, Vikings, possibly? Vikings? Um, and I, I know that, you know, in particular, Lyme Regis has been used as a location for so many brilliant contemporary films. Um, and of course, you can't move for statues of Hardy and Barnes and um, and all sorts of exciting and um, talented historical figures. Point about the road signs um, is interesting because, as the member for culture, yes, I probably have some influence around when we're looking at historic things like that. But road signs aren't really my job. Um, that sort of comes under highways. But I take your point, and when they're refreshed, when they're due to be refreshed. Maybe there is something more that could be done about recognising local dignitaries, landmarks, historical figures. Um, Sam, I don't know if you want to comment about the collections that we hold and how we publicise them. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, we, we do hold um, a number of prominent literary archives with our, uh, as a result of our relationship with the Dorset Museum. Thomas Hardy being the most obvious, but also William Barnes and Sylvia Townsend Warner. Some John Fowles material you mentioned as well. Um, our, our role in this, I suppose, is making it available so people can do interesting, good stuff with it. Um, the problem we have is um, we, we, we're, fund, we're trying to fund the cataloguing, and that is, that is I referred to it earlier, that's, that's a little bit of a stumbling block at the moment. So we have these wonderful collections, but they're not widely known um, because the, the detail of it still needs to be brought out through a cataloguing process. But... I mean, I point to the um, Elizabeth Frink archive as, as a sort of cultural character and how important that is. That, that brings in, that, that's an internationally important collection. It does raise ours and certainly Dorset's profile. We've got, I think we've got the BBC here this week, next, filming for their um, Pay Call Fortune, I think it is, based around a Frink, a Frink find. So things like that happen and, and, it, and it does link to galleries and, and, and museums. Um, certainly across this country and, and, and into Europe as well. Um, we, I'm, I'm very keen to grow that, that side of what we do. So cultural figures, if, if, if they are known and if they have a, an archive, it's obviously sensitive when people, um, sensitive when people die. You don't want to sort of march in and ask if, if a material is, is, is there and available to transfer. But we, we, do, we do keep an eye out and, and sensitively try and approach, um, you know, um, uh, the, the relevant parties to see if you know they, they'd be interested in, in growing the collections because it's quite often an, 
um, after only after a period of time this material becomes of interest so you're never never quite entirely sure but that's one of the joys of doing this job is is you know what what might we how might we grow the collections where are the gaps who are the people who are going to be of interest to future generations thank you that's that's really interesting information and i guess it sort of segues as seamlessly into the uh, seamlessly into the next item because i know one of the ambitions around the capital project um, is that we get more people in so um, we have got a series of recommendations Oh, sorry, Beverly, get, come on back in. Apologies. That's no, no. That's fine. That's fine. Um, I think that 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 the, the topic of the discussion fits really nicely with the other thing that's happening in terms of tourism and the other government wanting to simplify the destination management organisations and create um, some new areas across the country. And um, as as you know, Chairman, we've uh, been having conversations with Dorset about how you can look at um, a, a new an area that incorporates that. But I think the uh, and, and what's coming out of that is that there are lots of opportunities for certain campaigns across Dorset, across BCP. So something like um, a literary trails, that sort of thing that would be um, across the whole of the county that will increase the increase tourism, um, that particular interest. Um, and I think also some of the um, the work that's coming out of the um, but that can't get my words out with them um, how the um how the archives the dorset history center can go out into the public domain as well there is something there i think in terms of um getting uh, in sort of outreach out to people bringing all these literary characters across dorset together and marketing it for tourism yeah, absolutely, Beverly, and it's it's great to see that that kind of enthusiasm and that energy. So let that be something that that we pick up together um, outside this meeting, because I think that's really interesting. Um, thank you. So, in the absence of any other comments, we've got three recommendations. Um, I'll go through them briefly. Um, it's recommended that the board endorses the implementation of the twenty one to twenty six service plan appended to this report that we've just gone through as demonstrating quality and value for money provided by the Joint Archive Service. That we note the range of positive and innovative work undertaken by the Joint Archive Service, and that we support the Joint Archive Service's ongoing work to ensure the safe and effective transfer of appropriate physical and di digital records from both BCP and Dorset councils to ensure the preservation of the corporate memory and to deliver council efficiencies. Now, I'm seeking um, a proposer for that Richard Biggs thank you very much and seconded Leslie yeah. okay all in favor people online just just wave there we go that's perfect waving okay fantastic thank you very much thank you Sam um, so moving on to item nine capital project update it's it's Sam again Thank you. Um, very quickly, to, just to recap for everybody, um, long-standing aspiration and need for the Dorset History Centre um, to, to extend its storage space for hard copy physical archives. Um, the building's done very well. It's exceeded its life expectancy in terms of storage, uh, but we are now um, 10 years after we, we started thinking about this and have, our attempts to, to um, bring about this project, we are getting very tight on space. and with the type of collections I mentioned earlier coming in, uh, no sign of it uh, that, that, that diminishing, um, the, the space situation is getting um, ever tighter. So um, following the, you know, f following the um, agreement between the two councils, the, the inter-authority agreement on archives, the consultants report, and um, we, we move forward. We submitted an, a, an expression of interest to the National Lottery Heritage Fund with um, with the blessing of, 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 of Dorset Council. We got a very positive response to that. That, that was in May of last year. Um, the purpose of approaching the lottery, I guess, is, 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 is obvious to, to everyone here, which is that the lottery is the largest funder of this type of heritage project in the country, and no other funder could begin to, to match um, the, the sort of financial requirements the, that we have. Um, 
we attempted to uh, secure lottery funding. It was known then as the Heritage Lottery Fund in 2017. Unfortunately, we met with a particularly um, a busy meeting and were unsuccessful, although the feedback we received was very positive. So we're now moving forward um, with the support of consultants um, on, a, on a project which has the working title, um, Parchment and Pixels, Building Resilience for Dors Dorset's Archives, on the basis that we are really seeking to build our digital capacity alongside our, our need to manage paper and parchment collections. Um, we have until May of 2023 to, su to submit an application. It's quite an onerous task for anyone who's been involved in, in any of those. Pool Museum was obviously a, uh, well advanced with their project, but it, anyone who knows what's involved, it's, it's quite a big, big piece of work, all, all encompassing really. Um, so that's what we've been getting on with. We've had um, the support of consultants to work on the activity plan, which is the, the, the public engagement side of the project, without which the lottery will simply not um, be interested in, in, in anything else we're trying to do. The bricks and mortar, um, obviously essential to us, is um, something that they will help fund, but the really interesting thing for them is how we're going to get more people to connect with more of the collections and enjoy and engage with more heritage, put bluntly. The upshot of this, I hope, um, we all hope, is that up to 60 to 65 percent of the total project costs might be met by um, the National Lottery Heritage Fund if we're successful. Um, it's a two-stage application process. Um, we, would, we wouldn't actually start assuming all goes according to plan and our first applica stage application is successful. The second um, stage would need to be then completed. Um, we probably wouldn't start actually doing anything by way of capital um, improvements to the History Centre until um, at least mid-2025. Um, we're talking to Dorset Council's um, capital program team so they're well aware of this it's on on their list of, of projects that will require match funding from the council if it's to, if it's to um, proceed um, although of course the spend wouldn't be required until 2025 the the art I think of this at the moment is understanding what building inflation and contingency would be required in order to fully fund because the lottery tends to operate on the basis that once it's allocated funding it doesn't like to uplift it um, so we need to be very cautious about what we ask for and ensure that we're, you know, we, we've done all our due diligence in, in potential inflationary costs. A um, bit there on, on section three about, about the consultants that we're working with. We're just about to start working with the, um, the capital consultancy side of it, the, the architects, quantity surveyors and so on, who will be helping us review what we did last time and, and try and shape it into the... Um, the, the, the REBA format that needs to be submitted to lottery. Um, I think that's probably the, the, the where, where we got to, but that's the summary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a, a really good summary, and certainly the, you know, the, the work that I've been involved with, with the parchment and pixels has been, um, you know, really, really interesting and really comprehensive. Um, I, I don't think anybody underestimates the scale of the task at, at hand. Um, opening it up to, to colleagues then, um, any comments? These are um, two recommendations that we're being asked to note today. Um, so I don't think we need to, to necessarily um, propose these. Richard. Yes, I mean, this has been obviously rumbling on for, for many years um, and it was, it was very disappointing that the previous one didn't get... Um, you know, we are where we are. I wish it um, every, every luck. I suppose my only observation is that 2025 just pushes into the life of uh, new two new councils um, being elected, which could change the dynamic in any all manner of ways, I guess. Um, it's something else to, I guess we just got to carry on regardless with, with all the, the planning and, and go ahead, but just be mindful. Um, and the, the only other thing is, I, I think building inflation may well peak, because usually when in a recession, you find that uh, work drops off rapidly, um, and it could actually be beneficial. Yeah, really, really good points there. And I think, um, you know, as, as you say, we, we, we prepare the work and, um, and, and we keep moving on, and, and we really, really hope that this one's successful. Um, so if everybody's... Mm, Sorry, Marion, did you want to come in as well? Apologies. Thank you. Um, 
I mean, th this sounds a brilliant scheme and a lot of excellent work already underway on it. Um, I'm slightly puzzled. The first uh, meetings of the Archives Board I came to, which is only, what, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk around a new site for storage and where that new site would be. Do, do I gather from this that that search has been uh, put aside because of the extension to the current place? Or is the, the search also ongoing? Is it, in other words, is this scheme a replacement for a new, um, an additional storage site? Or it, it, are they two separate things? Thank you. Um, this, this, the, the project in question here would, would be about extending the current Dorset History Centre site in Dorchester. Um, we did do some fairly extensive um, options appraisal work um, back in 2012. That has been reviewed subsequently by, um, by property colleagues here. The capital receipt, um, if, if, if it would, I mean, we did look at, for example, what capital receipt might be received for the sale of the Dorset History Centre site, and then, but the rebuilding costs were prohibitive to move it. There'd be the question of land purchase and where exactly you, you would locate it. So um, it, it, it really didn't present with any serious alternative options, but to extend on the relatively narrow um, envelope that we have at the History Centre, um, which is which is what the proposal is. It's a two-storey extension with with improvements to the public spaces um, in addition. Um, we're trying to do it on, on the most um, cost-effective manner possible because um, the lottery, of course, will be running a ruler over everything we, we submit. Have we looked at uh, other options and so on? And there's there's been no um, alternative really suggested that would, would better what, we, what we're currently working on. Thank you. I, I, I got the impression um, when I first got involved in the board, as I say, it's only a couple of years ago anyway, I'm very new to it still, um, that it was looking for physical storage. I mean, um, not, not for a visitor centre in any shape or form that the public would, would access. So this sounds much more useful and much more appealing and, and much more um, relevant to me. So, yes, I welcome it. Brilliant. Thank you, Marion. Um, any other comments? Simon. I did have the benefit last month of visiting a gentleman with many other people at Minton, whose forebear took over the British fleet in October 1805, following the death of Nelson. And on his wall, he had two very large paintings, one of the Battle of Trafalgar and one of the following day with many masts broken by the storm on the day following Trafalgar. And it does strike me that we are going to be in something of an economic storm. And it would occur to me that it might make sense for you to engage with the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Sport, Tourism, Heritage and Civil Society. Nigel Huddleston, who has visited this county in recent times, and to set out the dilemma that we have in terms of what we have to offer the public, what we have to offer tourists, but the lack of resources that we have to make those exhibits reasonably available. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. Really good point. I know that we do engage with um, Westminster on pretty much every level that we possibly can. Um, and the Cabinet is involved he heavily in supporting the leader um, in his conversations with central government about our core funding um, for, from Westminster. So I will feed that in. And thank you. Any further comments? So the recommendations are that we note the progress made towards developing the application to the Lottery Fund. We note the deployment of the JAS reserves to support work on the lottery application. Is everybody content to note um, that feedback and that report that we've got from Sam? Brilliant. Many thanks. So we will now move on to the fees and charges report, which I'm just going to scroll through until I get to. Um, there we go. So we've got um, a new 
product and pricing structure, Sam, and you're going to walk us through that. Thank you, yes. Um, just, just very briefly, really. This is a, the review um, regularly undertaken of what the Joint Archive Service charges for its, uh, as you say, for its uh, um, services to the public of uh, all, all um, types. Um, it would come in, if, if approved, it would come into force um, from the 1st of April 2023. Um, I think perhaps the important point for me is that we've done some fairly close benchmarking with um, organisations of a similar type, um, both locally and in a, in a regional um, and, and sort of uh, peer, peer organisations um, listed there in two, uh, section 2.1. Um, and we've also uplifted our charges in, in, in line with Dorset Council's um, uh, suggested increase or target increase of 5%. So across the board, we, we've, uh, we've exceeded that. Clearly, what we want to do is, is to be able to serve, serve our, our customers, the public, um, in, in a way that uh, is, is affordable and, and manageable so people can do, do and achieve what they wish to achieve, but equally to properly uh, uh, compensate um, the service and the council for what it provides. And we hope we've reached a, a kind of a... Um, the, the sort of optimum point between those two things um, in that in that tariff of charges, which is available for everyone to see there in, in the appendix, um, with both the current fee and the future fee, if approved. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And as you say, it is a balance. You know, we don't want to put people off engaging with the services, um, but equally, we, we do have to be aware of our budgets. Now, just having a quick look through those those suggested ch changes, um, the increases seem reasonably modest. Um, and I personally think appropriate and proportionate. Um, I don't know if colleagues have any comments on this, if you had a chance to look through the appendix. Um, Desley. Uh, well, it's a query, really. It's about the baptism and burial certificate from a parish register entry, which is going up a pound. And then it says right at the bottom on the star, uh, subject to change by the Church of England. And I'm just interested to know whether they'll put it up, down, what, you know, almost, what's it got to do with them? But uh, inter just interested to know. Exactly Thank my thoughts too. <laughs> Thank you. It, it's statutory um, fee that they they levy. We we can't we can't set our own. So it's subject to, to whatever fee they tell us because it's done on a on a certification that they provide. So that's why it's charged at that rate. Thank you. Well done, eagle-eyed colleagues, for spotting that one. Um, any further comments, Richard? It's just an observation that some of them seem to have gone up significantly more than. 5% some of the charges and, um, you know, CDs, £5 to six, £6, pound, you know, in percentage terms is, is a lot. Um, I, I just hope it doesn't put people off because it's sort of, we're not having any benefit if, if people decide to do that less. I think we need to monitor that and review it and if there's a significant downturn, perhaps we need to think about that if we can compare one year, to, we should have good records, I would imagine. But I just think little and often is always the better way than steep hypes, because that's the sort of shock of, I mean, it was five pound, now it's six pound, well, I, won't, I won't do that now. You know. Yeah, it's a really good point um, around the monitoring, and presumably we are going to be doing that, because we, we know from, I think, from the first item that, you know, you referred to as how we come out of COVID and engagement numbers and how we monitor that. So this will, this will be part of that process? Yes, it will. There is certainly some um, a degree of the un uncertainty about some of these charges. Some of them haven't been put up for some time. There is that kind of uh, um, what appears to be quite a steep rise, but it's actually been quite at that figure for, for, for a number of years. So what appears to be a steep percentage rise is actually catch, playing catch up in a sense. On, on But I take uh, councillor's point entirely probably you know incremental and, and small perhaps rather than uh, you know leaving it over a period of time and then uplifting is probably a better plan but obviously if, if these fees if people are turning away and they simply won't pay what we are now hoping to charge then clearly we need to review and and act accordingly
Thank you. That's reassuring and definitely one to keep an eye on, um, I think. Um, I've got uh, Marion and then Beverly. Marion. Thank you. Um, mine, mine's a very specific one. I note that permit day permits for photography, the price proposed is, is actually going down by, I think it's three pounds, from 35 to 32, am I right? Something like that. Um, I'm wondering if it, I have no idea what sort of annual figures would be involved, how many of these permits are used, what, what the difference in, in receipts will, will turn out to be. But it, it seems in this current um, financial environment, um, throwing away three pounds a time, although a small amount of money, um, is, it, is it necessary? I mean, it, are the current figures putting people off? Um, I, I know nothing about this. I'm, I'm asking for information. So far, well, we, as I say, market testing is being done with, with organisations of a similar type and um, mission. Um, we won't know if people have put it off until, of course, we, we actually um, uplift the, the fees. In, in, our, in the past, um, in precedent terms, um, you know, whilst the public, nobody wants likes paying more for anything particularly, um, they, they do accept, most people, that there, there's inflationary costs associated with everything at the moment and what we're trying to do is, is strike that reasonable balance. Um, in terms of income, we have been affected by, badly impacted as have many organisations by COVID. Um, we're seeking to obviously emerge from that now um, and, our, and our fees um, we hope will be will be met with a, you know, whilst not, nobody's going to be overjoyed that things are costing more, that they will be prepared to, most people, to, to, to pay what, we, um, what we're suggesting. But this one is a reduction. From 35 to 32. I, I'm sorry, I've just seen what you've um, just been pointed out to me. I can't quite explain that one, I'm sorry. Um, I... I <laughs> Poor, poor editing. Um, I suspect that's an, an, an error. I will go away and come back to you, if I may, about uh, what we're talking about there, because it shouldn't have gone down. Um, that, that's, that was my feeling. Throwing away three pounds a throw, uh, even if there are only a few in the air, it's uh, yeah, good money. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I, and I can see on there that um, the, the rates have been split into half day and day, um, which represents an increase. Um, but it's just the weekly ones then that we yeah. need to tighten that up because gone from ten pounds to seven, but that's only for a half day, so that makes total sense. So if you could have a look at that, Sam, um, then that would be brilliant. Thank you, Marion, for pointing that out. Beverly. Yeah, I suspect, Chairman, that that some of these things might be elastic and some of them are probably inelastic as well. Um, and I'm not sure if, or if we know what they are yet. And as you say, it needs to be monitored. So I'm curious as to about the benchmarking we've done in setting these prices, who, who we did that benchmarking with and the market testing, but also to play a bit of a devil's advocate, although notwithstanding some of the increases are slightly more than 5% because it's to bring them in line. Why 5 and why not 10 which is will be more in line with where we're heading with inflation. Thank you. Um, the organisations we benchmarked with were um, places like Surrey History Centre, West Sussex uh, Record Office, but also locally um, with Dorset Museum, for example, within um, in our locality, um, plus a range of services in the South West archive services. So we did, we did look, all their fees and charges were available online, so it was quite an easy exercise to, to undertake. Um, five percent because um, because it was the Dorset Council's um, suggested target increase. Um, as you say, some of these have gone up. It's not a standard five percent application. We've looked at each of the charges and and have amended them or uplifted them in accordance with um, particular um, circumstances. Some some have gone up f uh, much much more than five percent. Some have, have haven't gone up um, particularly um, at all. So it is. It is a mixed picture, and a very. We've tried to be tried to apply variable um, percentages where they where they appear appropriate. Could I just uh, just pop back in? And what do we anticipate that will do in terms of income? 
good question. I'm afraid I don't have that. I don't have that number um, to hand the, the likely. But I, what I'll do is um, talk to my financial colleagues and come back to you, if I may, about what we're looking at there. Unless, unless you're able to provide us with something. Yeah, Paul, do you want to come in on that? So, Paul Ackrell. Paul Ackrell, um, finance business partner for Place Directorate and Joint Archives. Um, if we work on budgeted figures only, as opposed to uh, the reality, which is if, if people change their behaviour, but if we assume that behaviour stayed the same, uh, a 5% uplift in the round um, would generate about £2,800 of additional income. Okay, right, it's not going to change the world, is it? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, and, and thanks, Paul. That's really helpful. Um, bit of detail there. Leslie. Uh, can I just say that, uh, from my point of view, on the committee, it's a service rather than an income-generating um, body. So I'd just like to make that point. Yep, very true. And, and as ever, we, we do try and strike a balance, don't we, between covering our costs, washing our own face, and providing a good value service to our residents, which is, after all, why we're all here. Um, okay, any other comments from anybody? Any other members wish to um, ask a question, make a comment? No? Okie doke. In that case, the recommendation that is in front of us is that the revised fees and charges in Appendices 1 and 2 be recommended to the executive bodies of the two funding councils for implementation from the 1st of April 2023. Um, I need a proposer for that, please. Richard, thank you. And who would like to second? Leslie, thank you. So are we all in agreement to make that recommendation then? To taking some With the proviso that, that what figure I queried and maybe any others um, is sorted before we make the recommendation? Uh, yes, um, I think we can make the recommendation um, around the item with the proviso that Sam will come back on that one specific point um, in good time for us all to have a, 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 a sight of it before anything Thank would be taken to our exec bodies. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, so now we're going to move to the final um, item. And for this, it is exempt business. So I need to move the exclusion of the press and public for the following item in the view of the likely disclosure of exempt information within the meaning of paragraph uh, four of section schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 1972 as amended. Um, do I need a proposer to move to exempt? Yes. In that case, do I have a proposer? Richard, thank you very much. Do I have a seconder to move to exempt business? Leslie, thank you. Um, we'll just go quiet for a moment while the live stream is finished um, and any members of